can't think of a seminal piece of legislation that has had more impact on the people of our state than, than what y'all did. Billions of dollars of savings to the people of the state of Texas. Compliments to the craft and the vision of Steve Owens and David Sibley and Pat Wood. You have to have a political will from the top down to do something this big. For my 24 years in the legislature, we had gone through a lot of deregulation. And we saw trucking deregulated, we saw banks deregulated, we saw the phones deregulated, we saw the airlines deregulated, and now we were coming to electricity. In 1995, George W. Bush interviewed me with his boots on his table, and he said, Pat, we can promise better prices, and I think we can get them. We can promise better customer service, and I think we'll get them. And we'll most likely get better technological innovation. But the bigger issue is that they, the utilities, care more about what we, pointing to the House and the Senate and himself, think than what the customers think. And that's wrong, and you're going to change it. Competition was starting to show its head in different states in the mid-90s. At that period of time, there was a lot of work going on in California and some of the East Coast states and in Europe uh, about breaking up the electric utility monopolies and Texas began to look at other models and say would any of these work for us. We had state leadership that was very visionary and interested in trying to do the right thing for the state. And people were starting to like the idea of shopping around for an electric provider much like they did for a telecommunications provider. So it was sort of a perfect storm for significant economic and social change and that's what SB7 became. We started traveling. Yeah. And we traveled to California. There we learned what we did not want to do. I mean, it had so many flaws. So Texas looked at these other markets to say, let's ignore the bad and let's look at what's good that they did. So we visited Harrisburg and then something clicked. And they had a price to compare. So that's what we looked at and said, you know, that looks good, but and then that's when you all came up with, what if, what if the underlying costs change? And I remember on the way back, we had this napkin thing, and we just said, what about this? Weren't we discussing the price yeah, of these? And there? you just kind of did a tic-tac-toe here on the back of a napkin. And when I saw that, I said, this will work. I think that would work. There were three things that were going on at the time that made competition in the electric utility industry both an inevitability, um, but also an opportunity would have significant price spikes, causing electric rates to go up. The gas prices were bouncing up and down, and there were all these new emerging technologies, renewable energy and energy efficiency, that were trying to come into the market, but the utilities were blocking the evolution of the electric utility industry. Senate Bill 7 restructured the electric market in Texas. Previous to Senate Bill 7, customers were served by what we call vertically integrated companies, meaning one company built the wires and owned the generation and served the customers. As an economist, waving a magic wand, I would like to have all privately owned firms competing with as much, you know, as much competition as possible. Whereas if you have a market that is um, heavily regulated, consumer choice is heavily limited. And all of that ultimately comes back to the bottom line. And that's actually what it means for household budgets. We wanted lower rates, that's first. But the second was to shift the risk of loss from the consumer over to the companies. On January 20th, the Senate Bill, Senate Bill 7, was filed. Uh, Rick Perry is lieutenant governor. And when we passed it out of the Senate and sent it over to uh, Chairman Woolens, I had so much confidence in you, but I'm thinking, the House, I mean, 150 of them, I don't know what's going to happen. I've seen so many good bills go over there to die, you know, somehow. <laughs> they always have accidents. It's worse than the Godfather. You know, they just disappear. <laughs> so one of the goals that I had in the House is I wanted to drive down the price of bills because Texas is a hot place to live and our electric bills are high in the summer. And secondly, I wanted the rules to be such that um, 
there would be an investment for a new generation so we would not have blackouts and brownouts and so the reserve capacity margin could go back up to 12 percent as we move down the road into the next decade so we can encourage new growth. And the third thing I was concerned about and what I wanted for a goal is that by having these predictable standards for the future that we would not only get new companies coming to Texas but at least the existing utilities that were in Texas would not leave our state. So what we did is we would have hearings over in the house and the hearings would go on until three o'clock in the morning. We were negotiating late into the night, frequently nuances of the bill. Remember the big table that Steve Wellen set and said early on, what is it you all need? And uh, helped put together a very carefully crafted product. And every time that we took up an issue, we would go through everybody and everybody got to express a point of view and to be critical of each other. And these were experts in their field. They, were, they had expertise we did not in the legislature. We knew policy and we sort of wanted to hear it. And then we could individually make up our mind about which direction to go for a good policy. We, the three of us, would go back to my office and we would talk the bill out, and then we would write it up on the uh, flip chart with the magic marker. And as one of us took the lead in, in writing it out, the other two would go up there and scratch it through or take a different marker and say, maybe it should work this way, maybe it should work that way. And we'd go to the next page and the next page, and we would keep writing out the bill together until we got to a place that we thought it was comfortable that we would convert it to, to a substitute bill. It was the best legislative crafting I have ever been part of. We're just trying to make sure that whatever was agreed to here was something that you know, we thought was good policy for the state, but more important, whatever they passed the law, that was our job to implement it. So can this be implemented? And then we went about constructing a Rubik's Cube that we knew what everybody wanted and we knew what everybody didn't want. All of the stakeholders from the ratepayers to the municipals, to the co-ops, to the investor-owned utilities, and the unions, and the Environmental Defense Fund, and the public groups. There was a guy around the legislature, his name was Smitty. Remember Tom Smith, he's a public citizen, and he laid it out, you know, what his vision was, and that was that we would require each provider to have a certain portfolio of renewable energy. And when he put it to me, I said, you know, I like that idea. I said, do you mind if I call Governor Bush? Of course he didn't. I get Governor Bush on the phone, threw it out to him, and he said, great idea. I hung up the phone and said, Smitty, we're going to do that. And so when we got through juggling all of these different competing interests and listening to them, we constructed the bill, and at the end of the day, we had everybody sitting around a table much larger than this table was, every one of the stakeholders, and it was the night before the debate, and I went along to each of them and I said, you, you, what you wanted is addressed here, right? and therefore I want you to sign a pledge. And I prepared a piece of paper, and this is a copy of the pledge. <laughs> this is the pledge. And I passed it around, and they all signed it. So that when it came time for a vote on the floor, everybody wasn't there to sabotage the bill. I always had in my heart that this was gonna work. Why? Because the stakeholders were vested in the process. They, I think they really wanted to see it work. and. Everyone worked hard to make it happen. When it came out of the house, and we concurred in the changes because they were so good, and then it went to the governor's desk and he signed it. And once the governor signed that bill, then we had to go put it to work. And I really got to call out Pat Wood for the vision and the way he expertly managed that process. He took the, the bill and broke it into pieces and had a series of workshops and working groups how are we designing this retail market? What are the roles and responsibilities of the retailer and the customer and the generator? This was really going to become a national model and that they wanted to do it better than California and they wanted to avoid the pitfalls that had occurred in Europe. When we went live in 2002 with the competitive electric market, I think one of the saving graces to all that was the foresight of Representative Willens and Senator Sibley to shepherd an education campaign and help inform consumers. Because if we didn't have an education process, I think people would have been, no pun intended, but in the dark. An overwhelming success is a competitive, vibrant market. No other state has the kind of vibrant residential market that we have. So a lot of money was put in to educate people how to go about teaching them to switch on their own. 
and to move from one competitive provider to another competitive provider that would give them what they wanted. I think customers do appreciate the fact, certainly I appreciate the fact that I could chop around, I switched a few times from one company to another. They have the choice, choice to choose. Yep. When we started doing this in 1999, less than 4% of the grid came from wind. Now it's in 12 to 14 percent of the state's power. In uh, a couple of days last year, I believe wind or renewables contributed over 50 percent of the mm -hmm. needs of the grid. It's true. The big surprising success was the enormous renewable energy boom that resulted from the decision to put a little goal of having 3% of the state's energy or roughly 2,000 megawatts of our state's energy coming from renewables. And that has transformed West Texas and has put uh, tens of thousands of people to work and helped push the cost down. Texas is the number one state in the United States in terms of wind capacity. And if Texas were a country, it would be sixth in the world for the ability to create wind generation. In a state where you have growth, it's rare to see costs go down. But in, in point of fact, in the electricity market, costs have gone down because the competitive market does a better job of, of setting those rates than regulation does. While I initially opposed competition because I wasn't really sure it was going to reduce costs, I was wrong. It's worked. And as a result of the enormous number of new players in the market, not only have uh, we attained significant emission reductions, but we've also seen significant uh, reduction in air pollution. So here we are in 1999, worried about, will somebody spend $8 billion to create new generation over the next sure. eight to 10 years? And here we are 15 years later, and they've put more than $20 billion in the state of Texas for brand new generation. I would say that that is a good story. 100,000 people have been hired, you know, new jobs in the state of Texas, innovation, you know, with metering and then the, the wind and the renewables, you know, those innovations are coming on strong. I've been around the world because other countries have wanted to know how we've done this. Texas, uh, in general, it's been viewed as pretty successful uh, and in a lot of ways a model for other uh, regions to consider when looking at um, moving forward with liberalization efforts. It's been very gratifying to be able to tell the Texas story. So the, the process that led to that was I think for the three of us the most enjoyable professional experience of my life. It was for me. This was as exciting and fun and challenging and hard and consequential of two months as I've ever lived. I really am pleased with the way it worked out. I thank y'all for making this happen. You guys are dear friends. Very much. So I appreciate it. It really changed Texas for the better and has become a model not only for the United States, but has been looked at in many other countries to see how various parts of those decisions made have turned out and whether they might work in their countries or in their communities. We just put the Texas spirit behind it, the ingenuity, and, I mean, we're wildcatters in our DNA, so we were going to make it happen. <laughs>